This is the February virtual interim of the Weber to see working group. Just a reminder that we're covered by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies that are listed on the status page are allowed to make substantive contributions. Today, we're going to cover Weber to see SVC, Weber to see extensions, Weber to see stats, media capture extensions, ice controller, face detection, and auto pause. We have the dates of our future meetings laid out on the wiki page. Um, links to slides are up on the wiki as well. Do we have a scribe? I can scribe. Thank you. Um, as we mentioned, this meeting is being recorded and the rep recording will be made public. All right, we operate under the W3C Code of Conduct and Ethics, so please keep it professional. Um, a few things we've recently changed. We're now using the hand raising tool to get into and out of the speaker queue. So if you want to speak, please raise your hand. Don't just speak, um, and then you'll be recognized and you can talk. But uh, if you jump the queue, we'll mute you. Uh, please use your headphones or an echo canceling speakerphone when speaking and state your full name. And then we may use the poll mechanism, I'm not sure we're gonna do that today, but we could to get a sense of the room. A little bit about document status, just cause something's in the repo doesn't mean it's been adopted or that it has consensus. We run uh, calls for consensus and calls for adoption on the mailing list. We'll talk about those in a minute. And editor's drafts don't represent working consensus, uh, but uh, working to Editor's drafts don't, but working group drafts do. Okay, so here's what the agenda is for today. And we're gonna give people warnings. We will try to keep to a strict time schedule because we have a full schedule. Um, so we'll give you a warning two minutes before our time is up and then we'll move on. All right, uh, here's a summary of the CFCs that we've run since the new year. Uh, we had a CFC on low latency streaming use cases that concluded on January 16th. Uh, people were generally favorable. We had five in support out of six, uh, but we filed six issues, so we need to address those. Um, so I guess, uh, Tim, we probably need to sync up on, on fixes for those. Uh, and then we had a CFC on the face detection API. We're going to talk about that today. That also concluded on January 16th. That had six responses, five in support with one objection and five issues were filed, three of which were new. Uh, and then we had the one-way media use cases, CFC, which concluded on February 6th. We got seven uh, responses on that, five in support, one objection, one no opinion. 10 issues were filed uh, relating to that CFC. So uh, I guess the author would be, Harold needs to uh, deal with those. And then um, we had a CFC on recycling, Weber to CPC, that concluded on February 10th. 12 responses was, were received all in favor. There was only one issue, which is related to the name of the spec. Uh, and we resolved that by changing the name to Weber to see real-time communication in browsers. So that's a summary of all the CFCs that have gone on the last uh, two months. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Henrik and Fippo. We've got 20 minutes on where we're to see stats and where we're to see extensions. Uh, and this is what we're gonna talk about. All right. Okay, Byron Campen from Mozilla filed an issue that we have round trip time defined as mandatory to implement while responses received is not. And that's correct. And if you look at the round trip time, it's typically we have a common pattern that you divide the total round trip time by the number of responses received. So what we currently have as MTI doesn't make sense because it's you need either one of them or either both of them or none of them. That's a small inconsistency and we need to decide whether to make both of them mandatory to implement or remove both as mandatory to implement. It seems that Jan Ivar had a comment. Uh, yes, so, sorry for uh, being late to uh, add a comment. I added it to the issue tracker. 
but I think based on uh, the Firefox's ice stack does not compute total run trip time. Uh, we were under the impression that uh, the spec was moving toward using smooth run trip time instead, which is an SCTP um, uh, stat, uh, only to realize that later, uh, so the working group, apparently there's some history that we agreed on, that was a good idea, but then no one had implemented the SCTP transport stats. So that got removed from the spec. So uh, I guess another option here would be, or maybe in in parallel to this discussion, is there interest in uh, bringing that back? And I think if there is, maybe we shouldn't make this mandatory to implement. Does that make sense? It does. But uh, what you're proposing is an SCTP level metric, which is similar to the RTCP one. And we have the RTCP one in at a different layer. Uh, yes, this is true. But uh, but the question is whether um, one metric is better than the other, and if it's not clear yet, then maybe it's uh, too early to say mandatory to implement for one of them. Uh, you can get round trip time even from the ice, either from the ice stack or from data channels, right? Yes, but in some cases the SCTP round trip time will be end to end, while the ice round trip time will be towards the peer terminating ice, and they might be different in an architecture involving an SFU. It depends on really? who terminates SCTP. Can that be different from the endpoint? I can send you an example later. Okay. There was a cranky geek talk which had that issue, but things okay. can be different. Okay, in, in general, I just wanted to express the sentiment. I think Mozilla is not super happy about implementing total run trip time. Uh, if, uh, since that, we don't currently compute that. And it sounded like earlier, the working group had decided that that was a poorer metric uh, even than the SATP one. But if there are cases that are not the same, you know, that would be, um, challenging, I guess. But so far, we're just talking about whether they should be. We're not preventing anyone from implementing these, right? It's just whether what should be the guaranteed minimum for web developers, which I think is important to establish. How about this next? I think. Yeah. So. Um, uh, Candidate pair stats dot. Total round trip time is a per 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 candidate pair metric. It's uh, the, it gives totally different information from SATP or RTP uh, metrics. Uh, which uh, so if RTP switches from one from one one candidate pair to another, uh, RTP uh, round trip time will follow. Uh, Will uh, likely change, while uh, the ice candidate pair stats around total around around their time should not the RTT. So, uh, I mean, if uh, I think we should just keep them as mandatory to implement both, but uh, since uh, for. Firefox uh, has not implemented them, and uh, and we don't have unif uniform and un uniformity on it. So uh, we, I wouldn't uh, object strongly to making them not mandatory. But uh, uh, no, uh, you can't exchange one type of RTT from another. I'll leave it to Arun. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say the same thing, which is that smooth RTT is on data channels, and people who don't use data channels would not get. Uh, I mean, you would. They wouldn't have the RTT measurement, uh, which would not make sense in this case. Um, I think for the ICE candidates, 
we should have both uh, like i don't think you can measure total round trip time without sending stun binding requests or some kind of stun messages so if you don't implement it then you won't have responses received and you would not have a uh, total round trip time so if uh, i would rather have both of them uh, if it's possible and if uh, mozilla is not going to implement it then then maybe there's a case for it not being mti but having only one of them as mti make does make sense without the other because you're measuring anyway both uh, at the stack level so if you have them you can show them Tim? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think it would be nice to have them both uh, MTI, but I don't actually see that they're directly correlated. There are things that you could do with with one without the other, like knowing you're still getting responses is useful and that the response count is going up, even if you don't know what the, round trip, or the total round trip time is. So I don't, I don't see them as being irretrievably tied together, but it would be nice to have uh, like have them both MTI, I think. I mean, Rune's point about them being like, you can't derive them one without the other. That's true, but you don't have to expose them both. And there are uses that you could make of one that don't use the other. Um, but I, don't, I mean, I don't... Uh, yeah, I don't think, and particularly maybe in this like future programmable ice world, actually exposing them both might be much more useful. Um, that might be actually be a useful thing you want uh, that'll crop up at the end of this session. So my point, Tim, uh, related to the fact was that total round trip time is already MTI. Uh, so total like total round trip time without uh, responses received is kind of meaningless in that sense. So getting responses received as MTI makes a lot of sense as a consequence of that decision. And I, I mean, agree with you. The, if we were talking about both of them, we had to pick one, then responses received would definitely be like higher on that list. I mean, I suppose pedantically you could watch that it was the, the total round trip time was still going up. And you'd know that you hadn't had a round trip if it wasn't. So, like, there's something you could deduce from it. But yeah, that's pretty obscure. Uh, just for, yeah, just to interject. Yeah, I also agree that uh, responses received should have the uh, same exposure. If total run trip time is mandatory, then responses received should be as well, and vice versa. OK, so what are the next steps here? We can either make both of them MTI. I think that's what we're leaning on, but uh, kind of depends on Mozilla's position. I guess our position isn't, I mean, we see the value of having a round trip time measure for, uh, for most web developers, but I think in the ways that it is different than uh, a, a SCTP transport, I, I guess I'm assuming that most applications, 90% will will um, just want the round trip time of the connection and would take either. Is that not no. most of the cases? I mean, if we don't use data channels, then there is no SCTP. Right, so there's an overhead of negotiating data channels. Isn't there a third measure, which is the current uh, round trip time? There is. So, yeah. I mean, short term, you, you use that. And the other, what we're looking at here is long-term average to try and get a sense of like, you know, what this, in fact, to see whether the current is different from the average. That's actually the most, probably the most interesting thing to look at, like how, how wildly is it varying? Mm -hmm. 
So I would, sorry, me again, uh, Yanavar. Uh, the, so I would argue since this is already implemented in several browsers, that us changing a decision here doesn't really impact much one way or the other. Um, other uh, it doesn't impact other browsers in Firefox, basically. So it's it's a question of how strongly do you want do we want to push on that one browser? And if we go by the, we should change the spec based on existing implementations. Uh, it would suggest not you know, making it non-mandatory. Just like we removed SCTP stats from the spec because no no browser is implemented. And that's where that other and uh, that other rarity is defined. Right. Yeah. So, do we have any uh, notes or next steps for this? I, I think we're going to need to move on to the next item. Should everyone just hit the, the thumbs up for uh, NCI and thumbs down for uh, and for for no and uh, see if there's a clear indication? Okay, why don't we do that? Um, One, two, three, hit. I went had an opinion too. I think we declared this uh, no consensus at the moment. Okay. I left All right. the issue. So is there an agreement that uh, if we adopt uh, a nice API where you could switch, for instance, to a given candidate, uh, that then it would be good to do that? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Tim's opinion about the future and so on. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but first, we have to get off this slide. <laughs> yep. All right. So, OK, so that that's <laughs> where we are for the moment. OK, next. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what, what should I do in terms of scribing? Should, should I just say, uh, please continue the discussions on GitHub, basically? Uh, good question do we do we want to go to a, a, a CFC or what's the next step I think continuing discussion sounds good okay let's wait another month no right. implementations will change at all I guess all right Henrik yeah uh, yes thank you so in get sets power efficient encoder and power efficient decoder exposes whether or not uh, hardware is used for encoding and decoding uh, and to address privacy concerns, we added a hardware exposure check, <clears throat> which said only to expose this if the context is capturing, uh, i.e. camera. Problem with this is that this uh, does not work in, in cloud gaming use cases that don't captures. And uh, a, a general problem, uh, it's not just this spec, but there, there's some inconsistency between specs uh, exposing hardware capability and we're not we're not consistent with when that is allowed or not. Uh, so, for example, the media capabilities already expose this, although it's capability rather than what's currently used. So there's a subtle difference there. But it has a privacy con uh, consideration section that's rather vague. Um, anyway, next slide. I'm proposing to resolve this inconsistency and to uh, fix the problem for the cloud gaming use case is that we add a step to the hardware exposure check that says uh, essentially that if power efficient, uh, the power efficient attribute is exposed in media capabilities for the same configuration, then we should expose it in get stats as well. Uh, so it solves the current issues, but please note that it appears that browsers today do always expose uh, power efficient so we would expose this as you and yes yeah so i think the, the subtlety as you mentioned is that in one case uh, media capabilities is saying hey 
I got hardware uh, decoding. And in your, in your case, in the stats case, that's not what you want. You want to say, hey, I actually have a decoder, uh, but I, I have a hook at a decoder, a hardware decoder. And that's more private information uh, because you can use that as a side channel information uh, if you can spawn, if one page is spawning a few, is uh, freezing a few decoders, and then another page is coming and is trying to uh, freeze a decoder, seeing that it's not, and so on, then you have a, a, a channel, uh, an information channel between the two pages. And that's uh, what we are trying to avoid, and media capabilities is, is not in that territory. So that's why it's different there. Um, so that's why I don't think we, we can say, hey, if media capabilities is exposing power efficient, then we can do that as well in, uh, in this thing, because it's totally different information. My opinion is that, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct, but I think it's rather obscure. Uh, it's, uh, I, I have a hard time imagining this being uh, used. But Tim, yes? Yeah, are we sure that you can't tell that you've got a hardware decoder anyway? Like, I, I would be very surprised if you couldn't just, like, look at the, at the RGB output in a canvas and decide whether it had gone through a hardware decoder or not if you were only looking for a couple of hardware decoders. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you could tell. There is some fuzzing done to canvas in some cases to prevent fingerprinting. So... Uh... Have, having web pages do that is good because then you, you can fuzz them enough so that uh, real web pages, canvas will, will be working and video printing will be broken. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, um, a couple of things here. Uh, remember that uh, we also have uh, encoder APIs that are and decoder APIs that are separate from capture. Um, and in, in those cases, uh, you, you can't really link them to capture. Um, also, you can really tell if, if the uh, acceleration is not there, because you'll see, particularly with um, codecs like AB1, you'll see a dramatic drop in performance. Um, and uh, so the, it's not like you can't tell, but the problem is <clears throat> that um, the, the app has to collect information and meanwhile, the user will be experiencing some huge delay, as an example, or they'll see the performance degradation. So it's it's basically, this is useful to um, let the app kind of warn the user that something's happened. So that, that's, what it's, that's what it's used for in practice in the cloud gaming cases. Um, so it, it doesn't really accomplish anything to, uh, to, to put on a, um, uh, there, there's no there's no real privacy information that's being leaked here. The app can get everything it wants anyway, but it just takes longer. Um, and meanwhile, the user's sitting there and their game is you know not working. So I I agree with that. Johnny, Ver? Yeah. So this is more of a question. So the uh, this is the the cloud gaming use case here. Uh, can already use um, media capabilities here, right? So they can already get the information. The, the uh, problem is some information. The the problem is when they expect to get hardware, but for some reason you get uh, software fallback, and that hurts uh, the experience. So they want right. to mitigate by, for example, changing codec. And wasn't there on, on the issue uh, a similar API proposed to detect the fallback? Does it have the same problems? Well, it's basically the same thing, I, I would argue. Like whether it's a Boolean or a counter or a, you know, it, it's, it still exposes that you had hardware and you don't. So the extra information that the cloud gaming use case would get here is the extra bit of fingerprinting that we're talking about. Yes. Yep. Bernard? Which some argue you could figure out over time. That was yes. Bernard's point, right? <clears throat> Yeah, just, just to be clear, Yanivar, just because media capability says you should have hardware doesn't mean you'll actually get it. And right. we've seen situations where you go from hardware to not having hardware, like in mid-session. <laughs> so you're you're in the part of the game where it's really you really want to have responsiveness, and all of a sudden you lose your hardware acceleration and like the experience degrades, and so the app wants to know right away. 
makes sense. I would argue that if if uh, if we want to improve the the fingerprinting situation, then we should do it uh, in a way that works for both use cases and not. I don't want us to be in a case where each spec tries to solve the more or less the same problem uh, differently. I think you're right there. I think Web Codex has the same issue because with Web Codex, you instantiate uh, a decoding task and uh, you, you might not know whether it's hardware or not. And I, I think there's an issue there. And uh, I agree that uh, both uh, the solution should be the same for, for both, basically. Yeah, uh, you and I've actually proposed a PR. I'm going to propose a PR for exactly that because it, it is the same in Web Codex. Yeah, we split this into two. Like one is is there consensus for trying to solve this in one place and have specs point to that place, and then you know uh, the second. Can, can you type it on IRC, or I, I can do it, but it's good if you can scribe it. Uh, I, think uh, I'm, I can write in uh, in chat. Thank you. Uh, Sign um, one spec. Uh, Tim. Yeah, I just want to say, it feels this feels like the wrong place to to fix this the specific cloud gaming problem because what they actually want is an event which says that you've lost your hardware codec. Like you, you requested it with capabilities and you got it and now it's gone away. What you want to do is be told that. Yeah, each each specific use case, like a, a separate API where you can use uh, an encoder or decoder would likely have its own API for the exposing that bit of information. Uh, like get stats is specific to WebRTC, web codecs would be a, a different set of APIs. So the question isn't like having one spec to expose all the same information. The question is, can we have one spec where the, the, the question, is it allowed to expose hardware? Like that question is resolved in one place. Then the, the information might still be exposed in different APIs, but we should be consistent about when we're allowed to or not allowed to expose hardware use yeah but uh, i mean I, I don't want to dig into this too far but i i, I feel that the n being told that you've had something taken away that you've been using is less of a privacy violation than being able to poll to find out whether you're going to get it and, well, and i think so i think there's a like a shading here of what what you're exposing in terms of privacy so there's, so it, it was claimed that uh, it's not a privacy issue because the web page can actually detect that information already. So if that's the case, uh, if, if like frame rate is dropping, for instance, uh, you can observe it in like two or three seconds. So maybe we're just talking about an optimization, but it, it might be good to actually uh, nail it down so that we have all this kind of information to make a, a potential judgment. If, we, if we're doing this change, uh, like we've done in the past, the team working group will say, hey, this is not correct. And, and they will be absolutely right. And uh, we'll need to provide them uh, the arguments that uh, we have actually uh, gathered. So, yeah, I think we need more justification that this is uh, okay because it's very easy to get this information uh, by existing web APIs. So, uh, so what is the next step here? Um, I guess Henrik wanted to do uh, this poll with proposal A and B. Uh, I think it's it's good to have uh, uh, some uh, feeling about in the room whether it should be uh, like Web Codex and WebRTC should be just one issue and the decision is made and is consistent or not. And then we can maybe move this discussion to either WebRTC or media working. So can we do a poll uh, for whether or not we should have one place to point to to not solve this in every other spec first of all that's good to me nice 
Okay, so it, it looks like people agree on solving the, the problem in one place. And then the second part is, do people agree that uh, I can point to power efficient uh, in the meanwhile? I saw both up, um, thumbs up and thumbs down. So I conclude that there's no consensus there. Um, so, so maybe an, another question is uh, whether it should be media working group or whether it's working group that uh, drives this proposal A discussion. Uh, I think that since media working group is uh, owning media capabilities and also is owning web codecs, I would tend to uh, have this discussion there instead of where it is. Yeah, uh, I think that this implementation was uh, kind of uh, after the blocking the exposure. So why don't we have a, a way to have some um, approaches to allow the cloud game to get this information? In the meanwhile, I, I believe that this question will be going on for quite a long time. I, I'm not quite sure, but oh, should should we have a way to have some information in the meanwhile for the discussion that's my question well, one proposal so so what happened is this was working in one version and then the next version it stopped working because we implemented uh, this recently added uh, privacy gate uh one like just to mitigate the the immediate pain could we add this as a feature at risk and then file an issue on uh, the relevant working group or should we just wait i think waiting is fine bernard has a pr so i'm guessing uh, there will be discussions at the next media working group meeting um, okay hopefully there will be press one way or the other john anyway yeah just wanted to clarify since i gave a thumbs down that i think uh, if someone could show with a polyfill basically uh, a way that the existing applications could detect this already and it's merely a moment of saving like a second or something i, I would find that very convincing thanks all right uh should we in the meantime bernard can you uh Add, you said you, you were filing an issue about this. Could you just add a pointer to that uh, in the issue for this? And then yes. we can continue the discussion. Yeah. I, th I think it actually, uh, the pointer is already in the issue, but because I referenced 730, but anyway. Um, All right. Yeah, I will, I will do that. Okay, right. but, but let's move on. No, no consensus in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ah, yes. Uh, so regarding the header extension, we have a lot of, uh, uh, or the header extensions uh, APIs, we have a lot of open issues. I'm hoping to, to get to all of them. So in a previous interim, we decided to change the API shape to this uh, get modify set pattern. So I think there's already consensus there, but there's other open issues like the name header extensions to offer as a confusing name and there's several issues related to uh, frozen array being used so in the next slide i'm hoping to you know resolve all of this uh, and hopefully the first slide is basically the same as before just other names so i was for the get modify set pattern i'm proposing get header extensions to negotiate for what you want to negotiate uh, you have the setter as well and then for what has already been negotiated, uh, you have get negotiated header extensions. So first of all, can we get a decision about these names? Because then we can create a PR. Um, the alternative name suggestion would be get header extensions and get current header extensions because that mirrors direction and current direction which already exists. Uh, opinions? Anyway, uh, this looks good to me. Uh, can I? So we're still talking about dictionaries here, basically, right? Uh, yes. It's, yeah. 
I, I don't have a strong preference on name, but uh, I think either works for me. Thanks. Any objections? Oh, uh, clarifying question. Um, it's not clear from the web IDL here, but uh, what's the intended uh, use of this? Uh, so next slide, I can I can show okay. an example. Thanks. So you use get header extensions to negotiate. You have a loop, and you have some amazing extension you want to enable. So you set the direction. So this is why it can't be a frozen array. That would be painful. Uh, you, you modify it. You do set header, uh, header extensions to negotiate the result. Oh, it should be extensions, plural. Um, you do your offer answer and hopefully get negotiated header extensions will reflect if the other endpoint agreed. Sounds good? Looks good to me. Yeah. yeah. Is it fully synchronous API or? Yes. Okay, and there's no need for uh, hopping to another thread or whatever to check things or whatever. Uh, no. There are some more complexities, which is this, this slide, but I was hoping to, yeah, so it sounds like we have consensus on naming. And then, so that part ready for PR, I, I, I take it as that. But okay, so the next question is, what do we do about uh, directions uh, not, not uh, being perhaps what you expect? Because um, direction could be what you want to negotiate, or it could be what you're capable of negotiating, or it could be what's your default, the default value is, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just doing a rundown about cases where something might not, you might not get what you want. So in the first 1A here is what if the capability of the header extension is receive only? So you have asked to send and receive something that's only applicable in the receiving case. Um, or in the one B is is what if uh, what if you you are trying to negotiate a, a receive only header extension, but the transceiver's direction is send only. So clearly that's not applicable. Uh, and the second uh, the point two there is well what if the extension is not supported by the remote endpoint? And my proposal to all of this is that we just silently downgrade the direction, like we don't throw an exception. Uh, I think that's the most web compat uh, friendly way to to deal with things. So if you if you get set, uh, then we can just down downgrade it to receive only. Uh, but in all the other cases, um, I, I would say that we we just what you set remains and then if the other endpoint does not support it then we'll not modify the header extensions to negotiate we'll only modify uh, get negotiated yeah. header extensions so this matches how direction and current direction works right if you if you set direction send receive uh, and you get an answer that's no. send only Henrik, we're now 10 minutes over, so I think we're going to have to move on from this section. All right. Uh, we can bring it back next month. Sure. OK. So. Yeah. Harold, you were talking? I was just saying uh, continued discussion in issues. It yeah. Look, look, sounded like we were close to saying, yeah, so, so it looks OK. Can we do re ready for PR and then take it from there and see if right. anything comes up? Thank you, Henrik. Right. OK, so we now going to try to go through some SVC and media capture extensions issues. Um, so this is issue 73 in WebRTC SVC. Uh, it arises because there's two types of simulcast that are supported in VP9 and AV1. There's traditional simulcast with multiple conings, each with their own SSOC and RID, and then in VP9 and AV1, we also have something called S-mode simulcast, which is multiple codings within a single SSRC. So issue 73, the question is, should we allow both simulcast types to be configured? And if so, when? Um, the specification currently doesn't uh, rejects configuration of S-modes if there's more than a single layer, so you can't do both at once. Um, and the reason for this was a concern that mixing simulcast types would complicate an SFU and browser implementation. 
uh, without providing any real value. So then uh, Florent asked, um, and he'll we'll show an example in a minute, um, whether you can simultaneously negotiate the codec and the simulcast type, how you do that most elegantly. Um, and here's the example. So in this particular example, you don't know whether you're going to get VP9 or AV1. You might get VP8. Uh, uh, and so it's proposing three layers with two of them turned off. Uh, and one of them has this S mode, S3T3, which is three simulcast layers, each with temporal scalability. That one's active. Um, and it's a send-only uh, transceiver. So then you, you do this. You don't know what you're going to get. and it turns out that you end up with VP8 instead of AV1 or, or VP9. And then, uh, so when you do get parameters, you end up with three layers, but not what you expected. Instead of S3T3, you end up with L1T3, because that's the default for VP8. Um, and then what you can do is you can then update it and, and turn on the other layers. So this is a situation where you basically, it, you don't know what codec you're going to get, so it, it's more elegant um, because you you basically would just do a, a set uh, parameters and you could recover depending on what codec you got. Um, so uh, basically what this argues for is being able to do, to mix, uh, allow an S mode as long as there's only one active layer. And so I wrote a PR for this in PR86 which essentially says uh, you look for whether there's more than one active encoding, and then if you have an S mode, you uh, throw. So, so that's, uh, and this is done in both add transceiver and set parameters. You basically say, hey, it's only invalid if you have more than one layer active and you configured an S mode. So let me talk about the discussion. So in issue 73, we then had uh, some discussion about this. Um, and uh, one, one question was in the example here, uh, in the ad transceiver, if you attempted to activate RID H or F, uh, you would throw because you, uh, you couldn't do that. And uh, that's fine uh, if, if you want to prohibit the browser from sending both S and traditional simulcast at the same time. Uh, then that's what you would do, and that would be the consequence. Uh, but Harold raised the question overall is, I guess, a general a point of philosophy, which is, are, um, how far should we go in preventing people from being stupid? And I guess another question is, is it always stupid? For example, um, you know, what if you wanted to send six encodings and you you wanted to do three layers each with two or something? Is that necessarily, is that something we have to prohibit absolutely that this could never be done? Um, and if so, why? Uh, the problem, it seems to me, is really the biggest issue is that traditional SFUs won't handle S mode anyway. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why they probably can't handle an S mode. Um, one is that at least today, I don't believe that any of the implementations set the RID with an S mode. So if the SFU is relying on the RID to switch, it won't have that information. Um, and so it could switch essentially multiple encodings to a browser, which the browser wouldn't be able to deal with. Um, and because if there is no RID, the only way the SFU can switch is if it parses the AV1 payload. And of course, uh, an older SFU won't necessarily be able to do that. So that's that's kind of where we are. Um, we have a PR uh, that, that actually meets, uh, I guess, Florent's request. That, that we able to be able to make the example work, uh, but the question is one of philosophy that Harold raised. You know how uh, how tough we sh should we be on on folks to prevent them from shooting off their own foot? Okay, UN. Um, so I would not. I would ask the alternative question, which is how how hard is it to do in uh, user agents? If user agents already support it, I would say, hey, we already have support. It's just exposing it, and maybe it's fine. But if it's like uh, if it's taking uh, some time to do it, it's a budget, and uh, we might as well want to avoid uh, spending this budget because maybe no one is asking for it. 
And if some people is asking for it in the future, then we, we might be able to reconsider. So I, I would tend to be conservative there and uh, keep the PR as is and, and for until some uh, some people ask for this specific feature. Flora? I agree with you and that it's uh, something that is not necessarily easy to implement in current user agents. But on the other hand, I don't think we can be uh, implementing everything all the time um, with all versions of user agents, especially future ones, uh, future versions of the spec. Um, I think we might want to have a mechanism that allows us to reject the configuration that the current agent is not supporting with proper justifications that application developers can use. Um, I understand that it's not great for uh, compatibility, but the reality of things is that uh, video configurations like that are complicated and it's unlikely that we will get um, even compatibility uh, for some advanced uh, modes. Harold? Uh, yeah, my my thinking goes that the spec shouldn't, uh, and sh shouldn't need to uh, stop people from being stupid. Uh, if it uh, complicates the either the implementation or the or people's ability to understand the spec. So uh, obviously, as long as we don't support S3T3, any configuration with S3T3 in it is going to be rejected. And that should be legal. We don't have a mandatory to implement that for, for, uh, for modes, except uh, S1L1 or L1T1. So uh, I think both the spec and the implementation can be simpler if we don't have to have a rule about which modes are allowed in which combinations. And we can still reject what's not supported. Okay. Yanni Bar? Uh, yeah, so uh, I like the API that Florent suggested here, and it uh, seems like a good way to negotiate things. So uh, unless I'm mistaken, I'm not hearing any it's, I haven't looked at the PR in detail, but it sounds like the PR goes some other way of loosening the restriction we have today. And it yes. sounds like Harold wants to go further. So right. unless I'm wrong, I'm not hearing any objections to at least take the first step and maybe uh, discuss going further later. OK. Uh, I, that's actually an interesting point, Yanni Um Yeah, uh, um, Henrik. What do you think? Oh, never mind. I was going to press the smiley plus button, but I accidentally pressed the hand. Sounds good to, uh, yeah, do this. So do we? Ba so basically, uh, the suggestion is to take the PR as as is, which just basically allows what allows Florent's example, and then I guess uh, Florent, uh, if you think that it can be loosened further, you'll suggest that. Is that reasonable? We can take it uh, by steps, uh, sure. If people want to do more complex modes uh, later on, we can do that. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So I think we have a we have a way forward on on this one. All right. So I'm going to turn this over to Jan Ivar. Uh, go ahead. So this is, um, we're switching now to media capture, um, where we have some, um, in Firefox now, we're, we're trying to implement permissions.query. <clears throat> and you may be wondering, why are we talking about permissions API in the media capture spec? Well, it's because the permission spec has perhaps wisely uh, pushed, uh, uh, in order to not talk so much about different domains in the permission spec, they're pushing a lot of the uh, specific language into the individual specs. So our spec now has, for instance, a section about permissions integration, where it discusses things like uh, passing in a device ID, which the spec allows for per device permission models, which only Firefox currently supports. Uh, unfortunately, no one implement, implements device ID yet. Uh, and that means that there's some 
uh, friction when uh, we're trying to implement this in Firefox. <clears throat> so currently, and one of them has to do, so I have two issues to discuss. One is uh, permissions query in per camera and mic permission models, per device permission models. Uh, and I have a second slide for a different issue. So, uh, so right now our permissions integrations uh, section in our spec says if the descriptor does not have a device ID, which is an argument to permissions query, not get user media of the same name, its semantic is that it queries for access to all devices of that class, so all cameras or all, our, uh, all microphones. And since no one's implemented device ID yet, sites today will use this to uh, query um, and call permissions query with a name for camera. And if they don't get back granted or if they get back prompt, they may enable, for example, showing uh, an extra permission stream that says, hey, this website needs to use your camera and microphone. Can we please, please, can you please, please turn that on? <clears throat> but the site here is actually trying to ask, can I call get using media unprompted? They're not really asking, do I have access to all cameras, which is, uh, tricky for us in Firefox because we cannot answer yes to the latter question even after the site has gotten the camera <clears throat> because permissions is per device, not all by default in Firefox. So the proposal is that it would be more web compatible to say if the descriptor does not have a device ID, its semantic is that it queries for access to any device of that class. And this should remain compatible with all device permission browsers. And additionally, sites can use device ID to inspect individual cameras uh, or devices. Any objections to this change? Harold? Not really an objection. I think it's uh, reasonably compatible, but uh, I note that uh, uh, if you then, if you call get uh, query with, without an ID, and then you call get user media with an ID, you can still get permission denied or pop up or whatever because yeah, the change in semantics is that uh, it is that as long as the camera exists that you will get when you when you prompt it uh, when you call get use media without the device id and we have implemented uh, get use media with device id and uh, then uh, uh, yeah it's a change change in semantic but uh, i think the change in semantics is okay Yes, uh, Har I think Harald is correct, and but in, luckily in that case, so if you have a device ID, you should pass it to both APIs, I think is the answer. Uh, Ewan? Yeah, um, that, that's fine by me. I think it makes sense. Um, just to say that the, the proposal should, is probably about if there's a camera that is granted, then return granted. It's not like if there's a camera that is denied, then return denied. Uh, I think it's something that, like that that you really want to, to have in the PR. Okay, yeah, happy to take uh, bike shedding uh, on the PR. Uh, Florian? Is there a use case for applications to ask if you have access to all the cameras? And how would you do that with this API if you want it? Actually, there's an example in the spec to do that where you basically call, uh, but it requires that you have called get user media first because you have to be able to call enumerate devices. So once you have uh, full enumerate devices access, you can do a for loop on all the devices you get back and request and check the permission state of each one, which is a bit of a fingerprinting vector. So that's why it's probably good that that doesn't work uh, without get user, media, get user media success. What about if the device ID is not is pointing to a device that is not available at all? Uh, all right. Do you plan to return something, or what's what do you want to return that, there? I believe that's orthogonal, but that's a good question. I also had when I looked at the spec, and then from what I could tell right now, uh, it's not. Uh, it seems the permission spec right now seems to say that it's as if you didn't pass in a device ID, which I guess might be a little surprising. So we might want to change that if we can. But I'm open to ideas there. Okay. Like for instance, if someone was concerned about prompting and 
the device ID was no longer in the system, and they would instead of getting prompt, they might get uh, a more a different value. So, but uh, can you open an issue on that? I think that might be good to discuss separately. Um, okay, well, I'll comment on the issue and then we can okay. try to continue there. Thanks. So, so is this issue ready for PR? Is it the resolution we can type? Uh, my co-chair agrees. I think it's ready for PR. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> right, so here's the second issue I promised. Uh, there's also with permissions query, and this happens for non-persistent permission models. So this would be Safari and Firefox. <clears throat> so um, and I had to pick on a particular service here uh, because each service has different UX. Uh, so in this case, um, uh, this is whereby.com. Uh, and, and showing you a screen that says the service wants to use your camera and microphone in order for others to see and hear you, your browser will request camera and access and microphone, request access. And you have to click a button here. Um, and this is shown only ever once in Chrome, but it's shown for every meeting essentially in Safari and Firefox. So that means, um, and this is because Safari and Firefox, you still get a permission prompt, uh, which is an extra click, but thanks to this UX is actually two clicks extra per meeting. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and for the reason for that, I believe, is that users in Safari and Firefox, the fact that they granted camera or microphone last time they used the site and the time before that counts for nothing, basically, in the permission spec. <clears throat> and there's an issue filed on the permission spec to perhaps add another permission state that says granted last time. But that's not, um, but that's, I think, it's a long term solution. And so I'm hoping to have a better solution that we can implement more quickly in Firefox. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So as a result, many video conferencing sites today, <coughs> excuse me, offer a smoother user experience to returning Chrome users than to returning users in other browsers, because the spec is basically ignoring past non-persistent permissions entirely. And this sets up sites to expect granted permission and to treat anything less as a user retraining problem, <clears throat> which we saw in the earlier screenshot. This unfortunately causes diverging site UX for returning users in browsers um, that persist permission from browsers that don't persist permission. <clears throat> so the proposal is that it would be more web, web compatible to add if the descriptor does not have a device ID <clears throat> and permission state is prompt, user agents that offer non-persistent permissions may return granted if the user granted device access to this origin the last time the origin requested it. So this would mimic persisted permissions in a way that users shouldn't have to be have granted persistent permission to get sites off their back, so to speak. I'm just using language to shorten the slide here. I'm running out of time. Uh, not saying one is better than the other. But sites can still use device ID, which they'll have on the return visits if they really want to get uh, the, the real answer for that specific device. And there are some use cases that have been brought up, like uh, televisit sites. Uh, not all sites are equal here. This is a UX problem that we should recognize that, for instance, if you're in a televisit call, you're probably in a lobby for a long time waiting on a doctor or something. And that's time that could be well spent to ensure that uh, the call is 100% successful when the doctor joins, for example. And uh, open to questions. So uh, this is uh, you're asking us to do to, to persist permission for uh, in a browser that has decided not to persist permissions. This sounds sounds insane to me. I mean, either we sh either we should uh, either the browser should permit persist per permissions, or it should not. The browser should decide. Uh, the idea that you have a stored permission for the for the non-specified device uh, that is 
that might actually be feasible, but it's a store. It is a store permission for the non-specified device. And in your previous slide, that should be counted as a store permission, and and uh, and the uh, the the result result of querying for permission for that should, that should should return true. Return granted. So yeah. yes, if you want to store permission, but uh, then. Then I'm all all in favor of storing storing permission, but calling it uh, uh, calling it uh, uh, saying that the, the browser does not uh, store permission when it actually does. I don't see the logic in that, and we shouldn't describe it like that. Okay, so, we're almost out of time. I'll let you in make a comment, and then I think we have to move on. You in? Yeah, just to say that um, we implemented the um, permission policy and uh, the user is setting some permissions and uh, the user agent is somehow changing this uh, value to web pages for fingerprinting uh, uh, issues. So if particularly if user is denying access, then we, we, are, we are changing it to prompt in some, in some cases to uh, remove fingerprinting issues. And I, I think the spec might want to provide some hints like uh, hey you might want to do that as a user agent but i don't think the spec is uh, disallowing uh, such behavior somehow the user is storing some permissions but then the user agent is extrapolating what's the user uh, stored permission and then it's exposing this value after a transform somehow so uh, i think that even today uh, Firefox might be free to actually implement what, what they want, basically. All right, thanks. So the, we uh, need I, to I, move on I, to the APIs controller item. So, so just in the minutes, well, what should I say? Uh, continue discussions, I guess? I, th I think so, yeah. Hey, Samir? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Samir Rujakar and uh, today I would like to talk a bit about uh, a proposal for a nice controller API. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so in short, uh, the proposal is to allow applications to have more visibility and control over which connection the API connection uses for transport. Uh, and on the next slide, to lay down some of the motivations for this, so the user benefit we're trying to get to with this proposal is to improve reliability of calls by allowing the application to actively manage which connection is used for transport. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why I think uh, it makes sense for the application to decide this. So firstly, uh, the application knows its use case. It understands the use case better than the ICE agent itself. Uh, so it has more information to decide on some trade-offs, such as the choice of network interface, uh, IPv4 versus IPv6, what protocol to use, uh, and whether or not to use Relay. Uh, and then another reason is just to acknowledge that the ICE agent might not always have uh, an answer for what is the right thing to do in every possible situation. And so uh, the proposal is to give applications a bit more flexibility to experiment, figure out what works best, uh, aside from the established standards. And then, uh, yeah, essentially allow applications to use the default behavior, uh, what it is today, uh, but also to build on top of that uh, in situations where it makes sense. So on the next slide, uh, why do, uh, so next slide, please. So uh, why do we need a new API? What's possible today uh, with respect to ICE? So uh, with respect to local candidates, uh, the ICE servers and ICE transfer policy can be set in RTC configuration, but that pretty much uh, limits what you could do with local candidates uh, by restricting to relay candidates or uh, all candidates. That's pretty much it. Uh, any attributes on local candidates cannot be changed uh, through the existing APIs. Uh, with respect to remote candidates, there's a bit more flexibility. So an app could decide to, say, filter out some of the candidates if it wanted to influence which uh, network configuration is used for the peer connection. Uh, 
But once a remote candidate has been supplied to the peer connection through our ICE candidate, uh, the only way to do that would be to initiate an ICE restart. So an ICE restart is another thing that an application could request. Uh, and then the last, uh, the last uh, capability is to get statistics on the active ICE candidate pair uh, with get stats. So uh, that's pretty much the extent of what's possible uh, with the API today, unless I've missed something. And then on the next slide is the overall shape of the proposed API. Uh, so what we're proposing is to allow applications to observe the life cycle of all ICE candidate pairs, not just the active pair. Uh, and then allow observing some actions that an ICE agent uh, is performing. So these actions are sending connectivity checks, selecting a, um, a candidate pair for transport, and pruning away candidate pairs. Uh, but we're saying, we're proposing that uh, not only can applications observe these actions, uh, the application can actually block these actions as well uh, in some cases. And then uh, on top of that, the application can decide to request these actions from the ICE agent for a specific candidate pair that the application has cho chosen. So on the next slide is a bit more concrete uh, version of this proposal. Uh, so it's an interface RTC ICE controller, uh, which can be supplied to the peer connection through RTC configuration. Uh, there's some informational event handlers for updates about the candidate pairs themselves. So that's uh, when a candidate pair is added, updated, destroyed, or selected for transport. Uh, and then there's some proposal events. So these are events that could be canceled by the application by calling prevent default in some cases. Uh, but essentially, uh, the proposal events will let the app know when the ICE agent is about to send a connectivity check or select a candidate or prune certain pair uh, and then decide to block those uh, actions. Uh, and then lastly, the methods allow the application to request uh, those actions from the ICE agent. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide. Uh, So this example shows uh, just the overall mechanics of uh, how the API might work. So on the left uh, are callbacks for the proposal events. Uh, in this case, the application is deciding to take full control of ICE uh, by canceling all the proposals generated by the, uh, by the, by the browser. And then on the right is uh, basically, the application doing ICE by itself by deciding which candidate pair to ping, how often to do that. Uh, when it's gathered information from those connectivity checks, it decides which candidate pair to use for transport and then which candidate pairs to prune away. Uh, so that's the overall mechanics. Uh, on the next page is a bit more realistic example. So in this case, uh, what the application is doing is uh, it inserts a callback for the, registers a callback for the switch proposal event. And it's deciding that if uh, one of the candidates in the proposal is, uh, let's say a private IP or it's TCP or it's an IPv6 host candidate, uh, then the app is going to block that switch. And then on the right side is an example of what an app might do with respect to RDT. So uh, it registers a callback for candidate pair updated, uh, which gives uh, the app updates about uh, certain statistics on the candidate pair. And then for the active candidate pair, the app monitors the RDT over time. And let's say it decides that if the RDT goes above a certain threshold, then it starts pinging other candidate pairs more frequently, and then it might decide to switch to one of the other candidate pairs instead of the worsening candidate pair it has at the moment. Uh, so that's, that's an example of something that's uh, possible with the proposed API. And then to wrap up on the next slide are some caveats. Uh, 
so the proposal uh, pretty much only covers uh, control of candidate pairs by the application. It doesn't affect uh, gathering of the local ICE candidates themselves. Uh, so the only levers for that are still ICE servers and ICE transport policy and RTC configuration. Uh, then uh, even though the proposal lets uh, application decide which candidate where to ping, uh, the actual stun pings are still constructed by the ICE agents. So the application can't uh, construct the contents of a stun ping. And then finally, just to keep the initial proposal simple, uh, we've restricted uh, when an ICE uh, RTCS controller might be used. And that's if uh, the bundle policy is set, set to max bundle. So only one transport is uh, negotiated. And then uh, the other restriction is on the use of uh, candidate prefetching, ICE prefetching. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some suggestions in the full draft uh, of the API on how the API might be extended. Uh, but uh, this is just uh, the first initial proposal to keep the API simple. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's all my slides. Uh, thank you for the time. Open to discussion. Peter, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. So I left some comments on the GitHub on GitHub and an issue. Um, this is very similar to what I proposed a long time ago, which I think I'll call, I called FlexIce. And I think it's great to give the web app more control over the ICE agent. Um, so I, I, I think in general, this is a good direction. Um, I did try to analyze the differences and things that might be missing here um, for, for the things I think might be better. For example, I think it might make sense to put this on the ice transport directly rather than having a different object. Um, but I left the comments there. Uh, so I, I have ideas of how it could be better, but I also think in general, this is a really good idea. Okay. Yeah, Nivar? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I have a bit of, uh, I think, Solving some of these problems uh, makes sense. It's hard for me to tell based on the uh, reasons that were given. Uh, like the thing that was being asked on the earlier slide seemed like, oh, that's reasonable. It didn't sound like a big deal. But then I kind of got a bit of a API shock when I saw <laughs> uh, the full controller interface. So I would love to make sure we can prune down to to find out what is essentially missing since we have an existing API. Uh, and if also I think I agree with Peter, if if you could work with someone like Peter to maybe reshape this into a smaller API that probably could fit into the existing transport, that might be easier to swallow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think we did consider. Uh, I I looked at the flex size proposal. It is uh, uh, to some extent it's somewhat similar, uh, but there are. Uh, I think some areas that don't quite overlap. Uh, I think uh, one of the main reasons for putting it in a separate interface rather than on RTC transport was to uh, allow this to be set up before uh, actually setting up the peer connection. Uh, whereas our RTC ICE transport uh, is constructed uh, quite a bit later. Uh, but again, um, open to feedback, and that might be something that could be worked uh, worked around. Tim? Yeah, I mean, I, I echo everybody else that I think it's it's a, something that's be useful to do. Um, but I have some reservations about the sp specific shape. Like, it's not obvious to me that an event API with defeat default is, like, the cleanest way to do this. It seems like a slightly um unnatural way of doing it but to be fair i haven't thought of a better one yet um i think it needs to be quite explicit whether you're allowed to change a candidate on your way through one of those events um uh, maybe that's already covered in the detailed document but but i think we need to be very clear about that um and the final thing is actually i would really like to add a feature which isn't in there which is um 
the ability to unpickle an existing candidate that worked before um, in a previous session. So if you've got a pair of, of devices that talked two hours ago and now they need to talk again and nothing else has changed about the network, it would be nice to be around and essentially be able to restore a, an existing candidate pair that you're pretty sure will work with, with a, as little um, fuss as possible. I realize that's a big ask on this API, but it would be really nice to at least leave space for it somewhere. Yeah, I think I was in the queue. Um, my comment is that WebRTC and the use cases has specific requirements for ICE. And I don't think this API meets all of them. Uh, for example, requirement N4 is the ICE station must be able to maintain multiple candidate pairs and move traffic between them. Um, and I didn't notice that in the API. So anyway, just uh, tying it to the actual use cases and requirements would be would be uh, helpful. Thanks. I, th I think it. Uh, so I think it's my turn. And um, I think it actually meets that specific one when move is uh, select a different candidate pair. Uh, but uh, to Janiva, I don't think the I don't think the the API is going to get very much smaller. And uh, the reason why this particular thing ended up with using uh, all that cancel uh, default thing was that uh, we were kind of saying, okay, if you, if you don't, if you don't uh, want to handle something yourself, you shouldn't have to specify a handler that does the default. And, but if you want to handle it yourself, you, sh uh, you should be very clear about whether the well, whether the browser or the or, or the user does does the event and will, and prevent defaults seem to be fitting the paradigm. It's a paradigm that we haven't used in this working group before, so I was a bit surprised when I came across it so, from a completely different place. Uh, but uh, I think it does what it, what it needs to do. By the way, some of the things that it uh, that we would like to use it for are the ones that I presented at the ITF uh, under the name of uh, Nicer about a year and a half ago. So reading up on that document might might give some more use cases. Okay, next. Um, this is Yuan. Um, ju just to echo what uh, Bernard said about the requirements and uh, use cases, like uh, connecting uh, with the proposal is good. And I was uh, one thing I was wondering was uh, it seems that with prevent defaults and so on, uh, it seems the uh, API might be. I'm not sure. I haven't. I only have looked at the API for like uh, 30 seconds, but might be uh, tied to peer connection. And uh, I, I would get excited if uh, we're able to use this API right now, but maybe in the future where there's no peer connection, but you, you create a, a nice controller, you create a transport, blah, 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 and then you, you can do your own thing, uh, uh, like in web, like web transport like or, or whatever. That, that might be something that is, uh, that, that, that is good to do. And um, so that's something to consider as part of this API proposal as well, if it has not been uh, um, taken into 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 account. Okay, so w what is the next step on this API proposal? W w what do we write down? Uh, so, I'm um, I'm not hearing any uh, violent disagree or uh, suggestions not to do this. So I will take some of the feedback. Uh, I will come up with some better, uh, some more use cases. Uh, and try and address some feedback about exactly where the API might live and the shape of it. And uh, maybe I can talk about that in a month. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on to Riju. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, as we know that uh, there was a CFC on face detection last month, and the summary was like five years and one objection. The concerns were put up uh, in three separate JTAB issues. And uh, we have explained the reasons both in mailing list and the issues. So I won't be rehashing everything. And we keep 
enough time for discussions. So the first one was applicability. So for Android, uh, Pixel Books, and iOS devices, I think this is a non-issue. Almost all devices in the ecosystem have the face detection for at least five years, in some cases like Android 10 years or something. So on Windows, the topic of uh, camera, uh, camera driver support was highlighted. Well, the driver support helps to achieve the power and performance data, which we have highlighted in the explainer. However, in other cases, when there is not exactly the driver support, there are fallback mechanisms, for example, some WinRT APIs which we can use. Uh, just that we have, we might not be able to achieve those benchmarks. Okay, so most probably I did uh, the messaging a bit wrong, Bernard. So apologies for that, because there was this emphasis on driver support. But I learned that there are there's a face detection effect class that leverages Windows dot Media dot Face Analysis in uh, WinRT under the hood. So repeating again, all Windows 10 and above systems can get uh, phase detection. Uh, it's just the performance would not be the same as presented in the explainer because we haven't POC yet that scenario. Uh, next slide. Yeah. The second objection was regarding uh, generality. Uh, so many would remember that we initially started the API trying to pre-optimize for many things um, which the platforms can't give us today, like contours and all the stuff. And the guidance was, let's work with the minimal set first and what's achievable presently and work towards an MVP. And my impression was that uh, we sort of had an agreement uh, on the overall API shape. Anyway, so after this uh, CFC, I think to put up this new API sketch, uh, let us know if this is a blocker for landing this face detection PR. But Tuka, you can explain to the group this new API sketch. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ritsu. So. <clears throat> Uh, what I propose here is to uh, allow defining multiple segments. Each segment can define, uh, in, in this example, we have center point or bounding box, or possibly future, future extension could be a counter. So using these, uh, these primitives, we can uh, define several segments in images which don't necessarily need to be uh, faces, but could, could be also something else. Uh, we have here in the dictionary segment, we have the DOM string type, and type would be one of the enum segment types. And in this example here, I have human face, uh, left or right eye or mouth, and this is easy to extend for uh, other types of objects like cars or animals or whatever need to be uh, detected later or describes de described and <clears throat> after the type of the segment there is id which is similar uh, to the id that we have proposed uh, before this id can be used for uh, tracking the objects that are segmented out from the video frames. And it's also the identification of a specific segment. And the next field part of allows describing segments hierarchically, so that, for example, uh, I would be part of face. And in that case, the part of field of the I would refer to the ID of the face. So this allows uh, describing uh, segments hierarchically. Um, and then we have the probability. This would be similar to the uh, probability that we have uh, already uh, proposed for the face detection. But in this case, it would be used for any, any type of segments that there are. So that's basically the uh, proposal that we think would solve the issue in, in the Issue number 
Yeah. So the third point was about variance of results. And I think this is a quality of implementation issue which allows innovation to happen in implementation without breaking the uh, API contract. So uh, previous cases like eco cancellation can be done by the OS, the UA or the web app, right? Like hardware encoders in web codecs, they also do not have uniform spectrum uh, uniform results across the spectrum. For the phase detection case, it will return a rectangle bounding box, and some platforms would be able to do a great job with lower rates, and some would need a bit more power usages and might not be able to achieve the highest standards, we understand. But if we use the fallback code I talked about in Windows uh, using the WinRT APIs, they will there should not be much variance within the Microsoft ecosystem. Uh, hopefully that will take care of this concern. So, and also I just wanted to highlight that uh, for organizations who can afford their own models, they are free to use a model loader API. And uh, here our objective was to give the web developers access to the same resource that a native developer would have. That's it. So maybe we can quickly have a discussion on these three on phase de detection first before I move on to the next uh, topic. Are, are, are there questions? Yes, you are. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good summary. Um, I think there are three issues, and the first and third uh, needs discussion. For the second one, uh, I think that uh, we can always evolve the API, uh, the API shape. So to me, it's not a blocker. But uh, one and three needs to probably be uh, further discussed. Okay. Um. Uh. Uh, so, uh, regarding next steps, uh, Bernard, do you suggest something for us? Like, uh... well, the uh, segmentation one, I think, is a good uh, good step forward because that that would allow the essentially the standard metadata could be used for multiple purposes. Um, so, I think that one is a good change. Um, the uh, I mean, uh, the, essentially, both one and three are really about um, developer acceptance. You know, will developers, uh, because you know, uh, will they find the API available enough to be willing to depend on it? Um, sure. So that's sure. that's the real that's the real question. Um, right. So, uh, so as I explained, uh, so apart from Windows, all other places, as you saw, almost every everywhere it is available and windows also uh, initially i was looking at only the MIPI based cameras which is like the surface and the hero devices the expensive ones but the lower but the winrt uh, api contract is like for all camera systems so it would also work so i think availability is taken care of now Yes, you win. Um, just, that, just to say that you, you mentioned that uh, this kind of API is, is available to some to some native developers, and there are some native applications that are using this API. Uh, maybe it's not a lot, uh, but I, I know some yeah. APIs that are that are doing so. So if this uh, if this API were evolving to to the web, maybe they would use that. Maybe they would use WebML. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but I, I don't yeah. think that this API is precluding uh, WebML in any case. No, no, no. So it's not. It seems it's, fine it's, then. It's complementary. It's like it's okay if you're a developer on Zoom or Meet. What you will do is first try this API. If it meets your standard, you'll always use this because this is going to be the most performant path. If it does not, then you take the rectangle and do your stuff. Like, it's just that we are giving a pretty high performance path ex complementary. Um, 
you which you can decide to use or not okay so uh, 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 my because uh, there was one blocking for bernard so do you think uh, it, it, like is there anything we can do to unblock this issue and land this so that we can start implementing the code and you know give developers a uh, developer trial like they can try behind the flag is yeah the, the it, segmentation change is fine with me mm -hmm. I, I think it could resolve okay. that that issue um okay. the other two are really not they're not uh blocking on my opinion they're really about the developer acceptance sure. so sure. you know that and that's not to be determined by what i think it's been determined right. by the trials and all that totally totally yes Okay, so uh, can we agree that we can land the PR so that we can start prototyping in Chrome and Edge at least? I, it's not the working group's opinion. I mean, okay. uh, I mean uh, whether whether I mean that's up to the Chromium process, uh, not yeah. the not the working group. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, what I meant was, you know, uh, once we land the spec, we can start upstreaming the code so the it's like can we land the pr that is the working group's opinion i guess so uh do you want to do a poll with a thumbs up or something or yeah i mean we had a cfc but uh, yes yeah I, i'm okay with it but okay so i think the rest of people already agreed so there so if you are okay with it, then we can start to land the PR there. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah. I, I think that it, it yes. would be good to uh, add these comments on GitHub. So, so Bernard, if you if you could comment that on the issue one and three, it's not blocking uh, landing the PR, but right. uh, but issue two is blocking the PR. So then we we can validate that the PR is uh, is aligned with uh, with what right. you what you commented, and then we can okay. have a for consensus but uh, that is closed yeah okay, okay. Uh, please write okay. that down in the notes thank you okay thank you okay next slide right so uh, uh these three peers have been in, uh, in a bit of a limbo for some time so to refresh they are just on and off switches to bubble up the features offered on native systems to the web so I do not see a variance of results within a particular native ecosystem. The availability on Apple is restricted to any M series. Uh, Google's Chrome OS team wants to origin trial uh, at least one and two with us. Uh, oh, and also whereby they were also pretty interested. Zoom, the talk is still going on. Uh, they are trying out some of the things which we have passed on to them. Um, yeah, availability on Windows might be a bit low today, but uh, that is 100% going to change very quickly within a few months. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, what can be the next steps for these PRs? I, I know, uh, Harald, you had a um, sort of um, opinion on iGaze correction part, but these days with NVIDIA's own solution, quite a few people were like uh, excited to see that feature. But, uh, and, and I, I would just highlight that uh, Chrome OS team and whereby have specifically asked one and two for origin trial definitely, and three they are evaluating. So with this kind of information, what do you think we should do with the PRs or next steps for these features? Let me see. I I must admit I have forgotten what I said about it last time. Uh, uncanny Uncanny Valley. I oh, guess yeah. correction. You said that it you uh, Google did a um, user study where some a big part of the group where worried it looked too realistic and too spooky because it was too realistic 
Yeah, because it uh, it was uh, close enough to realistic that it only occasionally broke. Uh, so so yeah. that you you would uh, think yet that you were get, you were getting the natural picture and suddenly something happens that <laughs> yeah looks good. yeah things have improved after that was last year we talked so yeah but so, yeah uh, uh, but the, I, I'm specifically looking for the first two uh, the next steps for face framing and lighting correction uh, because there was a good ask from team in Google to start origin trial on specific yeah. boards so yeah, no I, I mean the only only way mm -hmm. we learn learn whether or not it's uh, reasonable now is to try it yeah so so can we can we see that the next step is landing the PR and then we can put up the implementation codes soon. I think okay. we should, if you say, if you say it's ready, then we should, yeah, like I said, it's, yeah, it is. Uh, any objections or blockers for this part? Anybody who wants, doesn't want it? Well, uh, Jan, we're here. I, I don't know that we necessarily yeah. can sign off on these PRs here in the meeting. Um, okay. Right. Uh, I haven't looked at these in a long time. If I have looked mm -hmm. at them at all, sure. So uh, maybe some time to look at uh, and provide feedback. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so I think so. I think you need to. I see that uh, there are currently about uh, the current state says that that that, that I, I guess correction is draft. Yeah. So let's and talk about two others or not. So uh, can can you? Can you uh, make it not draft and then uh, yeah, check we can do there's no final comments? No open we comments can, on it? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, so the I guess uh, I, my P, P1 from customers is the first two. And I would treat I guess as P2 right now. But yeah, I can change it to not draft and move. OK, next slide. I don't know so, whether. So, just in, in, yeah. the, in the notes so we can say that these two are ready for PRs and for merge. No, they are, they are be, PRs. Be merged they, and they should they be will... considered for inclusion. OK. And there will be a call for consensus at some point after PR landed. Yeah. Is that correct? For for the two or for the three, the first three? First two and me? So, so, so we have to call a CFC again for those later on? Do, do we have to call a CFC again for those ones? So, previous slide. Yeah, we. Uh, okay. Yeah, we 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 can have a CFC for the other ones as well. Okay. Uh, do I know within this group anybody objecting so that I can fix before calling? Or okay, and their yeah, proposals yeah. so you can land the PRs and then we'll have the CFC. Okay. You Correct. You don't okay. need. We're not doing the CFC before. We're doing it after. Okay. Okay. So next slide. I don't know, Bernard. Are we out of time? I just saw a lot. Uh, you're getting close, but just try to finish up. Uh, Aero, do you want to finish uh, in two minutes? Just so long as I've got fifteen minutes or so, that's still okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ero. Ero, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, did it not register? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. So about configuration change uh, event. Uh, configuration of the track may uh, maybe it changed dynamically outside the control of the web application. Uh, one example is when we use a switch is uh, background background blur uh, uh, on or off through operating system. Web application might want to know when that uh, happens, but at the moment we are no direct way to do that. Uh, configuration change even would solve that problem. 
However, as a couple of details which should be agreed on. Uh, first one is uh, uh, which tracks should uh, trigger the configuration change event. It's most needed on uh, tracks which uh, originate from from a camera, that is, that is to say the get user media tracks. But it would be uh, maybe odd if it uh, would not apply to get display media tracks and such. Uh, second question is, uh, uh, should configuration change even be a configuration change event or, a, or just a plain event? The web platform design principles maybe suggest a uh, plain event, but uh, it would be good for uh, developers to have a, uh, have a, uh, a state in an event and there's some precedence also. So we would prefer that. Uh, the next question is, uh, should all capability changes trigger an event? Uh, I don't see an issue, why not? So, so I would say yes. And the uh, last question is, uh, 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 what kind of changes should tr trigger the event? Um, most notably problem is that we don't want to uh, trigger the event on every frame. So we, so we should exclude uh, settings which are in automatically, automatic uh, mode, like if a um, focus mode is in a continuous mode, then a focus distance may, may change continuously. And also there's uh, like an estimated uh, frame rates on some tracks. We should also exclude them, but other than that, I would, I would think that uh, all the other settings should trigger the event. So, what's your opinion? Yes, Joen. Uh, overall, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, for question four, uh, I think it's per source type. So, peer connection should say, uh, I, I, I think that it should fire or not fire based on this uh, thing. Um, for capture tracks, it should be the same and so on. But the overall approach where you say estimated settings, they should probably not trigger on everything that, that kind of makes sense as a general rule. But each spec that defines a source should basically uh, uh, defines it. Um, with three, yeah, it should trigger the event. And uh, with two, um, I guess I have a small preference uh, for exposing something, but uh, I'm fine either way. Yes, I'm. I'm mostly, uh, mostly the same. Yeah. Okay. I think we're out of time now. Um, so we we need to move on to a uh segment. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. What, what are um, the next steps? Just for. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're last topic. What are the next steps for this last topic? There is it. Uh, um, find some resolve in the GitHub issue, maybe, at all? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, I'll start. Uh, thank you. I'm Elad, and I'm here to talk again about auto pausing uh, with the stream tracks. Uh, so, just a reminder of last time, uh, we discussed the fact that it is now possible in at least two uh, different uh, browser engines. Uh, to switch which uh, surface you're sharing as you're sharing, and this is driven by the user. So in the case of Safari, the user can interact with the browser and says that they want to share a different window or a screen. And in the case of uh, Chrome, you can share another tab. Next slide, please. Now, when that happens, um, you might want to change something. There are a list of uh, examples here, but let's just focus on one, the one that I've highlighted in red. And that is maybe you want to change the cropping parameters. So maybe you're initially capturing your, your own tab, you crop one target, suddenly you're capturing another tab, and hey, maybe that other tab also has an interesting target, and maybe you actually want to crop to that target. And then maybe you go back to sharing your own tab, and things have moved on the page since then, and now you actually want to crop to a different target on your own tab, right? Now, so the problem is that even if you get events when that happens, which you might get through capture handle, 
uh, it might be too, uh, too late to respond to those events because uh, frames might already be on the wire by the time you handle the event. And there is no way that using events alone, you could ever be fast enough, right? So what I'm suggesting here is a mechanism for auto-pausing the, uh, the track uh, whenever something relevant happens. Next slide, please. Uh, so I, we discussed this last month, and one of the proposals that came about, if I'm not mistaken, by UN, uh, was to expose that on the source. And I thought that it was interesting, but since then I've thought about it a bit more, and I realized that I don't think it's a good idea. And the main disadvantage is that you can crop tracks. And if you crop tracks, uh, I'm sorry, did I say crop? I meant clone. You can clone tracks. And the reason you clone tracks is because you want to use one track for two different purposes, right? So maybe you're presenting it in a certain resolution and frame rate locally, but transmitting it in a different frame rate and resolution remotely. Maybe you're cropping it differently, right? You could do all sorts of stuff. And that means that maybe you want to auto-pause one of those, but not the other. So I don't think there's a good reason to do that on the source. And there are other arguments, for example, the fact that we don't actually have, have an object for the source at the moment. Uh, so that's my counter argument here. <clears throat> Additionally, uh, the idea of exposing this on capture controller also came about, and they think that the same objection applies here. There is only one capture controller. There could be multiple tracks. And to compound the problem, it could be that the tracks have actually been uh, post messaged away from the original context that have the capture controller, right? Um, so next slide, please. I propose this API, which is slightly modified from last time. Uh, I would ask you not to uh, pick it with a fine comb. Uh, we could change a lot of things here. Let's just look at the general picture, right? Uh, the idea is that basically uh, you trigger using set auto pause. You say, hey, normally tracks are not paused, right? Like we're not changing that in any way. But maybe you want to start for some reason, right? You get the promise back, and the promise resolves once you know that, OK, auto-pausing might take some time to circulate through the system, now it's on. Now you can rely on that. We can discuss this promise. If it's controversial, we can get rid of it. Now, assume that you did that. Now you also want to get events whenever you auto-pause, right? So you've got the handler. We notice that setting the handler of its own does not actually trigger the set auto-pause behavior, right? These are two separate matters because of a design principle that says that setting event handlers should not have side effects. Uh, once you get that, every time uh, something happens, in, uh, something like the top level uh, document of the tab you're sharing was navigated, uh, maybe the user clicked share this tab instead, or other things in the future, maybe conflict change. When that happens, you get an event, you know what changed, and you, you the application, have time to respond to that change. And the response can be immediate, like within the event itself, or a bit later, right? Because it could be that you need to uh, communicate with the other tab that you're capturing. It could be that you want to communicate with the user. The sky's the limit. And once you've made all of the changes that you need, you call something of the general shape of unpause. It can be a different name. It can be a different shape. But basically, you say, OK, the track goes to its original condition of just letting frames flow. And that's it. Things become usable again. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the clarifications. I think I've gone through them. Um, and next slide, I think, should say discussion. And I do indeed open this to discussion. Yes, please. Yeah, Nibar. Uh, yeah, so uh, so the, the key feature here is, is the auto pause. So leaving the events alone for a moment. That's uh, I, I'm not sure that I agree that an event cannot be done in time because you could clearly if, if the concern is only that um that you get the event ahead of switching that you could do that you could fire the event ahead of switching what right? will happen to, what what happens if the user uh clicks share this tab instead in the meantime the application just you know busy key uh busy hangs like will it keep on getting new frames you know even seconds mm -hmm. after the user wants to stop sharing the original tab well, in any case, the user agent could decide to wait to actually do the switch until 
the event is fired. I'm not saying that's ideal. I'm just saying that it is technically possible. I'm not advocating that. I was just making that point that it's not necessarily a given. Uh, but I think um, um, I have some general concerns because uh, I really love the feature that uh, Chrome and Safari, I believe, have added, uh, where you can switch the source. It puts the user in control. And there's an inherent tension here between uh, just like people have physical camera uh, shutters, uh, there's been API proposals to let apps know about the camera shutters, uh, which I think would defeat the purpose of having a physical camera shutter in the first place. Uh, there's, a, there's a tension here between if, if an app can detect that I'm changing the input through a user agent, then it can also I also have to deal with some apps that might prevent the application, prevent the user from doing that or imposing some kind of restriction on it. And this is there's an inherent conflict here. I'm just saying there's an inherent conflict. I'm not saying there aren't reasons to do that. Well, uh, I would like to respond. OK. Um, this is already possible. Nothing has changed. All of the change, because it is possible for the application to just, like, we're not given uh, we're not making it too much easier for the application to actually figure out mm -hmm. that you've changed the source. Uh, it was already yes. possible, and the application could already kind of try to pester you to do, you know, to switch back to the original source, etc. So all of that was yeah. possible. All that we're giving the is a way to drop frames of its own accord. And mm -hmm. I think that any malicious application would well keep, uh, keep asking for the uh, frames. I agree with you that an application could go to uh, an extent to detect this anyway. But when it comes to APIs, it's really about what an APIs, what behavior we encourage from sites. So if we have an API that uh, turns on auto pause, uh, my, a lot of applications might immediately turn that on because they get more control. And then we have to talk about are the side effects of that. But let me be more specific. So I'm not totally opposed to having some kind of solution to this problem. But I would mirror earlier discussions that uh, having it on the track, I think, is let's, let me focus on that location problem first. But having it on the track, you have to deal with video tracks and audio tracks. Uh, yep. And also, MediaStream track is the, is the uh, endpoint, not just for screen capture. So I worry that th these APIs set auto pause. Uh, we're having screen specific, screen capture specific uh, things added to track that then we have to think about what happens if I capture from camera, from microphone, or um, from canvas, from web audio, from all these things. Sure. Uh, so I agree there's a benefit to having one track uh, that has this behavior and another one doesn't. But I'm not sure that outweighs the complexity you're imposing then on web developers getting uh, audio tracks, video tracks synced. And I think having a simpler uh pause feature on capture controller seems better to me. Thank you very much. I would like to respond to that too. If you've got more uh, ideas, I, you know, I don't want to have all of them because I won't be able to remember them. Uh, so first, in the past, I've already uh, proposed a couple of times that we need to actually subclass uh, the string track to have uh, different. So A, uh, in the dimension of audio versus a video, and B, in the dimension of whether the user is sharing a screen, uh, a window, a tab, or something else. Um, so I think that if this is really a concern that we're exposing an API that's only relevant to some of those on all of those, then let's revisit my pro earlier proposal. Uh, but so long as we don't actually revisit that, um, we've got other examples of things that are only valid in some cases. And what you do, what, what happens is that if you call it on an irrelevant context, you just get a, an error. And that's OK. I think that we can do it here, too. Uh, anything more, Yaniver? Well, I wanted to make sure uh, if there were any other comments, I let other people uh, have uh, some input as well. Yes, please, Yuan. Yeah, so in terms of use case, that, that's fine. Uh, I think the API, so track versus source. Um, so you seem to have use cases for track. Uh, maybe it should it would be good to uh, document those uh, on the GitHub issues that we make a conscious, conscious decision because it's probably making things a little bit uh, more complex. Uh, I think it would be good to, I, I don't know whether we need the flexibility of the current API. Like you create a track and at some point you decide that it should auto-pose and at some point you decide that it should not auto-pose. So maybe we can say, 
when you create the track, it's the time where you decide whether you want to autopose or you do not want to autopose. Uh, because in, in, that, in, that, in that case, uh, the API shape might be uh, simpler and smaller as well. Um, I, I also do not like even sphere. M maybe it, it might be good to have um, uh, a callback and then uh, you, you have another callback or you use a promise, uh, for instance, so that you, you delay until you're done, basically. Uh, that might be uh, another pattern that we could explore in terms of API. Just a second, Ivan, if I could, uh, you know, one point at a time, because otherwise I get overloaded. Uh, so you've just mentioned that you want it on the, uh, when we uh, construct the track, uh, we are not, we don't actually construct the track, get display media returns it. Do you mean to say that you would like this to be part of the get display media options? Uh, that's one thing. I, I'm not saying I, I want this. I just, I'm just saying I want to discuss this option. Yes, because we, we, we are talking requirements there and we, we need to understand whether the requirement to, uh, uh, to, unpo to set pose and pose uh, dynamically is a good thing or not. So we should make a conscious decision there. Okay. And based on that, we will, we will go to the API. So, yeah. So, so in that case, I would say that I think that the answer is uh, clear from the example of clones. Uh, because you might want to uh, autopose one of the clones, but not the other, it means that get display media is not actually uh, the right time to do that. And after mm -hmm. get display media, so get display media is too early. After get display media resolves, you already have the track. So I think that we don't actually face a decision here. I think that our hands are tied. It needs to be on the track. It, it really depends on the API shape. Uh, I'm well, well, we'll discuss the API shape, but I, I want that we discuss that. And also track or source, it would be good that you, you document the, the cases and then we'll derive the API. And, uh, and yeah, we should get uh, a decent API uh, soon, I guess. Uh, okay, I think that I've presented um, use cases before, but I can document them in writing if that helps. Uh, and uh, Tim, just a second, Joanne, I'm sorry that I cut you off before. Uh, you had a second point that I was afraid I would forget and indeed I have. Yeah, um, so it's it's again API shape where you're adding, you're adding uh, an event, you're adding uh, a getter, an attribute, a read-only attribute, you're adding uh, two, two methods. And I would hope that we, we can come up with something simpler. Uh, as I said in the past, uh, service worker, for instance, is firing an event. And on this event, you can, say, you can delay the resolution of the event. And when the, the event is no longer delayed, bang, you would be uh, unposed or something like that. So we but, could think of different patterns that would uh, reduce a little bit the API shape. I understand. Uh, unfortunately, that would not work, or at least it would reduce the flexibility, because if you need to actually asynchronously communicate with the tab that you're sharing and ask it to give you crop targets, if it has any, any it, uh, then it's too late by then. Service worker is promise-based. So basically, you could use promises there. No, no okay. issue. If you've got an alternate uh, API shape that you could uh, lay out in the uh, issue, if it solves my use cases, of course, I'm going to be happy with it. Uh, thank you, Tim. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to convince myself that there isn't a, uh, that, that we need an API this rich. Is this not just a, a transform on a, on a track? Like, is this not something you could just do with the other tools that we're creating for, for, for doing transforms on the fly on tracks? I've not found a way of doing that, but of course, uh, at least not without doing a transform that sometimes drops, sometimes does other things. And uh, no, even that does not really work for me. But of course, if you've got a solution here, uh, you're welcome to post it on the GitHub issue, issue. And if it works, then it works. OK. Yes, Geneva? Yeah, just to iterate. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, maybe if you could have a time code or something on a video frame, there might be a way to do this en route without necessarily stopping everything. And that might give a better experience and give you all the more control, perhaps. But I, I just want to make, um, before Tim brought that up, uh, also the, the idea of pause here, uh, where it's going to be a little confusing in the media stream track space, because we also have other issues about we have enabled, disabled, we have muted, unmuted, and we're going to have paused and unpaused. Not to mention that we're talking about having other unmute methods uh, and an unpause. So that's part of my reasoning. I would love a simpler API just to echo that. And I was hoping moving it to the controller would would uh, alleviate some of that. But 
maybe naming renaming could help as well to call this something else maybe it's a type of configuration change or capture change or something like that so um here's my problem here uh, i think that using capture control <clears throat> if we have a good reason for uh to put it on capture controller of course we should uh, but right now it seems like the reason is elegance and you know not reusing names or not introducing more names into an already crowded place uh, space uh, but in terms of usability uh, you know the wanting to do different things with different clones is compelling to me and because of that i would like to push back on capture on putting it on capture controller uh, understanding that specific use case would be be good uh, that seems like an optimization uh, to I me but, uh, yeah that you, you said that some sources would, for instance, not have to inter intervene. So yeah, so maybe my self view, view wouldn't flicker when, uh, or the self capture view wouldn't flicker uh, if this is only needed on, for sending over the wire. Is that the idea? Uh, that's one example. That seems like, yeah. Yeah. That seems of some value, but not of a lot of value to me. But yeah. uh, it, it seems like uh, it's more future proof to say that clones are independent. So, folks, we're we're over time. Do we have any next steps for this, or uh, things we need to follow up on? Yeah, I would actually like to understand that because, from my end, uh, this is the second time I'm uh, presenting about this, and it's not clear to me uh, if there is any action item left on me. So, uh, what I think is, so uh, there are like um, individual. Uh, topics like sub issues like track or source so we should get to a decision there so maybe not there but maybe we should have a specific decision on github and then we we end up with a decision and there are like also over decisions on uh, the requirements and uh, we should discuss that as well and the api shape i think uh, is also part of that but i would guess api shape should come after we we finish this uh, earlier discussions Sure. Um, Has there been any proposals for exposing a time code on a capture track? I, I don't think that helps unless you also expose, uh, you know, not just the timestamp. I don't understand how the timestamp helps you. Yeah, crop, crop target, for instance, would not be uh, usable yeah. with time code. So you would need to do the cropping yourself. So that's. Yeah, but also determined when the user switched navigation, when navigation happened, for example. So I, I don't think that helps you because you don't know. You just see a, an ever-increasing timestamp. That's number one. And the number two is if you've already connected the track to an outbound uh, peer connection, all of the frames are going out and, until you do something, unless you post, which you should. OK. Well, I think we're uh, done for today. Um, thank you, everybody. And okay. we'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.